Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Everybody now, here we go. Oh, I like it. <laughs> well, it must be Wednesday, everybody. Wednesday, the walking baseline. <laughs> here we go. Oh, what a day. I'm actually Indeed. in the office, two, two idiotic episodes in a row, and I've actually been in the office. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> How does that even work these days? I've always been in my office. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't go much further than that. But it's also actually chilly in Arizona today. I know I'm normally hesitant to tell you guys how beautiful it is. And a chilly for Arizona, I must say. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Asterisk, right? <laughs> little... <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a beautiful day here in eastern Ontario. The sun is out. It's hovering around the freezing mark, which means that someday soon we'll be finally free of winter. And it's and it, the, the chilly bonds of winter, let's call them. The chilly bonds of winter. Yes, well, you Canadians, look at the weather all over the country and all over the world. I think we got some UK folks hanging out with us today, probably. Yeah. Yeah. As usual. Yep, yep, but hey. Cheerio. And Chris, we've got an amazing guest today. Who are we, we chatting do. with? We are chatting with the one, the only, the legend, Brian Chapman. <laughs> uh, Brian, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an, uh, an opportunity to introduce yourself and tell us, uh, you know, tell folks a little bit about your background and that sort of a thing. But uh, I will, you know, uh, fanboy moment here. The, the, your, your work that you've done over the years has been something that I have. And we were talking about this in the green room. I've consulted with a, a lot of times and used it and shared it with lots of folks. So you've been, you've been providing an awesome value to, uh, to the e-learning and the bigger training and development community for, uh, for a long time. Not that, you know, not that we're suggesting <laughs> long time. In, in, but in case there are folks who, have, uh, who are joining us today who haven't, you know, met you or encountered you. Uh, out in the wild, so to speak. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, absolutely. Certainly. Hey, uh, I, I'm getting a little bit of an echo in the headset. Sorry. Oh, I don't okay. Know what that yeah, we weren't, um, we weren't in the other one. That's okay. Yeah. Is, is it one of I'll us mute. in particular or? No, it's myself. <laughs> oh. oh. Okay, no worries. I'll, I'll okay. just uh, adjust accordingly. Yeah, well, like Chris, I think you, took, you touched right on it. I am... Uh, uh, I'm kind of a data junkie. So you were <laughs> referencing the uh, how long does it take to create learning uh, study that I did with Shell many, many years ago uh, that still I get tons of email on people saying, hey, uh, you know, when are you going to update this thing? Because, But I, I continually update it in the fact that I present it to people and ask the question, how long does it take you to create level one technology-based learning? How long does it take to create level three? And the answers keep coming out about the same. And so <laughs> we have that. Uh, but I, I'm kind of a data junkie, uh, but the way it works is my my main gig or my role is for years, I, I, I've been in the technology-based learning space for over 25 years and, and uh, studying learning platforms, learning technologies, but I spent the first decade of my career producing uh, learning courses for Allen Communication. Um, so I've got multifaceted part of my my career that uh, where I, I just work on projects that are... Uh, uh, sorry, the, the <laughs> little difficult with the feedback there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I work on projects that uh, working with clients to help them optimize their learning, and so that's that's what I do now. Uh, but I I still enjoy uh, uh, you know learning about learning, and so I think what we're talking about today and the topic really lends itself nicely to that. So yeah, and we're such a funny space because like I've been in it for twenty years now. And in some ways, some things haven't changed. People still have an LMS, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's still sort of the core anchor technology for so many, you know, training departments. Um, and then new things come along, but the, the you know, the world of the LMS doesn't seem to, to ever fade out, you know, really. Uh, but there's also lots of other things that, uh, that you know, do pop up technologically 
into our uh, into our space. Um, and that's what we're talking about today is learning platform, you know, innovations, things that uh, things that are new, things that where things are, are headed, etc. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit about uh, you know, how you go about gathering some of the info and, and, and stuff, uh, <laughs> sort of set a baseline of, you know, where you're coming from on that. Sure. And I think that'll be a little bit underwhelming in some ways, yeah. but but in but also fun in some ways. So let me uh, I'm going to share my screen here because I think it's a good opportunity to kind of uh, I'm not going to be doing a big lecturous presentation today, but uh, I thought that it'd be uh, nice to kind of share that whole where I collect the data. And it goes back to my own history. I am, um, you know, I, I early in the year 2000, I was uh, researching learning management systems all of the time uh, on my own. And also for the company I was working with at the time, which was an instructional design shop. And Brandon Hall heard about it. So they hired me in 2000 and I created the world's first, uh, along with a good team there, but I uh, worked on the core of the project. It was a big LMS knowledge base that where we collected data on, uh, at the time, about 50 systems that later grew by the year 2007 to about uh, 120 systems that we were covering and managing. And what was interesting to me always was to see that what you said, the standard LMS platform that's tend to be around forever. And also that idea that there was innovation all the time. Whenever we'd run an annual review of learning management systems, I would always finish that year by saying, I'd write down all the cool things I saw in learning platforms. And then I'd, I'd have eight pages of, of really cool innovations. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a technology that did all of that? And then I immediately look at the list and realize that would be an untenable system that would never work for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. today, the way that continues on is I, I continue to collect information about um, about learning technologies and and the innovations that occur and share that with my clients. And, and it's stuff that I don't get to talk about a lot because I'm so busy with clients these days. I don't get a lot of opportunity to share the, this research. I, I don't get as, to as many conferences as I used to. But so uh, some of you here, uh, I, I'm going to share that. I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing about it because it's uh, it's very interesting. It's it's something that people always say to me, well, why don't you publish this like your study of how long does it take to create learning? And the answer is uh, basically, if I published it, the day I publish it, it would be obsolete because it's it's just an ongoing effort. So I, can, I think that hopefully that takes us into the topic because the yeah. topic really isn't about learning technologies as much as it about innovative ways to engage or interact with people. Right on. And, and yeah. our learners, especially. So, Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it, it's, I think the last time I looked uh, for anybody or, or even just for myself, my own knowledge, I think there was like, I, people have had identified over a thousand different learning management systems these days. Right. And right. right so many, uh, it, it's shocking to me when I still hear of people building their own or having homegrown <laughs> LMSs. And I, it's just, it's a head scratcher for me every time I hear it, because it's like, you know, there's like, are you sure you couldn't find at least find something one? that already does this? <laughs> yeah. I know. Brent, you're, you're exactly right on. And it, it, it perplexes me as well. As When one falls, uh, six more uh, pop up. And, right. it's and uh, the you know, hydra of e learning. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And, what, and what's really fun about it is that I, I've been along for the whole history ride. So, so this isn't just something I started looking at six weeks ago. It's something that, you know, I, I mean, I, Samsung introduced their own LMS back in 2002. Samsung out of Korea, you know, and so it's mm. like, and they they were commercially, you know, really looking at pushing that and making it available on the market. And so it's it's fun to look over time and the historical perspective of these things coming and falling. But it, it really, let me take a couple of minutes and I'll, and I'll address Chris's question about how yeah. I collect that data to date. And I'm gonna share some stuff with you, you guys might be very fascinated to hear. Cool. And then also uh, that idea that um, there is innovation that continues to come. And the message, my central message today, if anything, is this. There's still a lot of innovation occurring out there. People come up with these cool new ideas. They kind of manifest themselves sometimes within these platforms. And then, but they're, they sort of go away by the wayside as well sometimes. But they're intriguing ideas that should be captured and preserved because there's some really cool things. And I'm going to share maybe three or four examples of, of those 
in a in a snapshot way. This isn't a promotional thing to promote product at any, at all at all. It's just more of a you know, how, how do we approach things differently as instructional designers, as people creating learning applications for others? So, Brent, I think you introduced it exactly right. I mean, it really starts with that. And I wrote 600 up here, but you're right. A uh, thousand is would, would not be an understatement. So I'm going to talk to you about this and I'm going to um, drop the headset for just a second. Just so but I'll wa wave your hand if you need a question there and I'll, I'll jump back in. But I'm going to just present a couple of things and then I'll and then I'll look for that some interactive dialogue. So there are all the are these, uh, you know, let's say there's 600 plus learning management systems and you go out to your to the internet browser and you type in. So what's the best learning management system? Try it sometime. I do it. I do it every few weeks and get the same kind of results. You get this massive laundry list of systems. It's just like, you know, here's here are the 600 systems and blah blah, and that just blasts right at you. Well, you know, hey, I've been around this for a little bit longer than some of these companies that are doing that information now. I've always had this um, mentality of trying to put some structure or organization around it to figure out what's what. So I'm going to share with you, and I'm not going to go through in detail these 10 categories, but I want you to get the idea of what they are. Uh, there's 10 major categories that I created, and it's a way to make sense of all this. And why, why do I create this? Well, several reasons. One, I help clients pick learning management systems, but that's really kind of a secondary thing that I do. Often it's going into an organization and saying, let's look at your learning infrastructure and figure out, well, what are you doing and what do you want to do? And do you have the right technologies, and I'll put the plural on it, to do what you need to do? So these 10 categories help to talk about or at least have some dialogue around what learning technologies can be. So you'll kind of see a few here. There's, um, you know, again, I'll just talk about a few of them. Corporate internal training. And that's that traditional LMS, the one that Chris says, LMSs seem to never die. <laughs> <laughs> and they are there. Those are your cornerstones and docebos and all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to break that down even a little further. Then there's this whole LXP movement. And I, I, I call it here in my chart, learning on demand, because it's LXP is just one subclassification. And then, Chris, for you, Stake and Domino and Brent, for you as well, development and delivery. Sometimes, there, you know, we talk about learning management systems. But it's this idea of learning more of like a learning platform or learning ecosystem made up of multiple platforms. There is an aspect where it comes down to how do I develop things? And a lot of the corporate learning, uh, learning management systems really aren't about how do I create the learning? How do I manage a team of 100 instructional designers to create learning? I mean, so that's where de development and delivery comes in. So Domino, again, a class system in that whole area. And then there's this external enterprise that's that's different. That's these groups that are trying to monetize learning. And I've worked with a lot of groups like that, not just monetize it within their own company, but groups that actually sell learning groups like Harvard Business Publishing, groups like um, Ken Blanchard. Go ahead, Brent. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, ooh, did you like that wave? That was a good one. So it, it's a good way for us to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a question. Karen uh, dropped a question into our question and, and ask a sure. question section at the bottom of the screen. And she says, where does customer training fall on this spectrum? But as soon as I saw the question, I think you just nailed it. So would that be the one? <laughs> it, it, it is. And the next slide will even go further because that's one of those areas. Now, again, I don't want to touch on each one of them, but I did want sure. to just kind of mention some others. Some people might see, hey, they're social collaboration centric LMSs. Um, wait a minute. Don't a lot of LMSs have social? And they do. All, a lot of them have uh, um, places to create learning communities and message threads. But hey, what about like Microsoft just got involved in the game? Just this last year, they, they launched Microsoft Viva Learning. Okay, yeah. So there's an example. So I So for me... The way that I approach this, Chris, as a researcher, again, is to say, what is Microsoft Viva Learning? Is it a corporate learning system? Hmm. Yeah, it, it is, but it doesn't fit that definition of being that traditional system that manages e-learning, instructor-led training, and 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 or uh, virtual classroom-based. You know, it's not doing that that central structured. I'm training an internal employee, but what it could be used that way. But what it is is it's 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 built around this idea that social is the center. And social meaning the fact that we're going to put learning in a place where people already meet and exist. And so that's where social learning. So, so you see why these categories start to form. And so I'm going to not going to touch on some of them. One of the fascinating areas is the specialized solutions. So let, let's break it down a little further. 
10 categories. Okay. I, you know, Hey, that if we take 600 learning management systems divided by 10, we're now down to 60 per category, right? <laughs> well, roughly. No, I can't do that. I got to go further. Boom, boom. Okay. You got, some of you, especially if you're watching on a phone, you're not going to be able to read this, but, but I, <laughs> I wanted to point out and I'll answer that question about customer education. Look down in the enterprise learning sector. The external enterprise section, there's customer education, but then there's groups that also do partner and reseller training. There are those learning publishers that sell courses like the ones I mentioned. I mean, I, again, working with Harvard business publishing or Ken Blanchard, they're not looking for a learning management system to train their internal employees. They're not even really looking for customer education, but they are looking for something where they can sell their courses. And in many cases, the big, defining factor of that category for learning publishers is my LMS needs to work with all other LMSs. You know, guess what? Up in the corporate learning space that those guys are saying, wait, we don't want our learning management system to work with everybody else's. So you see that, so you see the categorization starts to really uh, form around this association education falls in that area for me. Um, I wanted to test on the specialized area for just a minute because it's fun. That's where you get into the stuff like adaptive learning um sales enablement you know so now you've got learning platforms that are based around this whole idea of sales enablement and so i can share stories in each of these categories but the categories aren't just something i came up with arbitrarily the idea here is that we looked at ways that organizations are using learning technologies or have a learning strategy approach and like the categories are created around how they're using it so now Brent, we'll take your math problem there. There's a thousand learning management systems. Now let's divide it by 30 uh, by 37 subsegments. Now we can start make, talking, have some discussions. You know, we can say, here's this kind and it's for this purpose. So if you're an educational publisher coming uh, uh, to me, I can start to talk about, well, what, what are those characteristics that that group needs to make learning work? But um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about some that are from a uh, learner engagement standpoint. So but before that, any questions popping up on the thread that you're seeing or uh, yeah. ones that you might have? Uh, there is a question from Brian. He says, uh, or sorry, from Randy. Randy's asking, Brian, do you have insight on how to track social learning activities? Or oh, yeah. And that might be something we talk about now, or maybe it's uh, part of something we go to um, as you go along. It but is. And by the way, You've just seen all of my visuals. Well, actually, I had one more, but you've seen all, all the visuals I planned for this session. So, again, this is not a lecture webinar. I'm hoping to have the group drive this. So I want to invite people who are watching mm -hmm. to ask questions through the chat or, you know, just get some things in there. Perfect. But yep. the, you said to track social collaboration. There are many. Um, there, there's a whole social maturity model, and I've got a separate slide somewhere, but not in this deck. That's the maturity model for social collaboration. And it starts with just, you know, the basic idea. We introduce social collaboration. We pop up a, a, a discussion thread, in, you know, as part of our learning platform. Boom. Done. Okay. Next level, level two. It's kind of, and, and I had this whole idea of level one, two, three, four, five uh, when it comes to these maturity models. Level two now, you start to create... Um, you, you maybe uh, start to create learning communities, places with a specific outcome or objective where you share or have social around that. Uh, level three, I'm, I'm kind of roughly listing these out. Um, level three might be something where uh, the social is actually part of a structured course. So the course isn't just a course where I'm going to share information with you or push it at you. I'm going to push it at you, but I'm also going to require you maybe to be involved in some sort of social collaboration to demonstrate your competency. So see how the maturity model sort of sweeps up. So how does tracking work? We've got I've got clients who are tracking the amount of social collaboration that occurs. And I'll, I'll pick on one of my clients, actually. That's kind of an interesting one. And I, it's a, I can share this without sharing secret sauce. Uh, Harvard Business Publishing has excellent leadership courses. And they have a, a course that runs several, spans multiple weeks where there's a combination of self-paced learning, but there's also, um, there's also times when they meet and collaborate together. So there's meetings that are scheduled throughout the, the duration of the multi-week course. There are times when they are divided into smaller groups and asked to produce something as part of the uh, social collaboration and share it with the rest of the group. Wow, bing, you know, hey, are we tracking... Are we tracking social learning there? Yes, because 
they can't even complete the course without engaging in a social activity there. Yeah, yeah. So again, but it has to be carefully designed into it. Can't be just something that happens. Right. You know? And uh, we do have another, Amanda makes a great point in the chat. Uh, she says, I would love to find an LMS where learners don't groan when they hear the quote unquote <laughs> discussion board. <laughs> yeah. Oh, again, I, I love to share best case examples. Uh, the Peace Corps has an LMS. Now, one thing that they do with their LMS, and I encourage every organization that uses LMS to do something like this. Name your LMS. Don't call it our, our learning platform. <laughs> uh, Peace Corps calls their platform Guru. Hey, that what a cool name. It's got you know that worldwide connotation of wisdom. But here, here's their collaboration. How cool is this? They actually have a place in there where, where people that are in the Peace Corps can share designs and, and lessons learned with others through this community. So if someone in some third world country says, I'm dealing with this specific issue, how do I deal with it? Um, there are people who post their content back to the system because it's based on user generated content. Okay, that's cool. Well, now they start to classify or categorize that and push it back out through the system. Guess what? We found a new way of generating electricity in a third world country in a back village, you know, and we want you to learn about that. But boom, now the learning community isn't a discussion thread at all. It's a, it's a place where I can solve problems. You know, a good example, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's that kind mm -hmm. of thing that you now again, would you what category I'm going to back up because that's a big <laughs> thing. Like, what category would you be looking at for that? Well, all of a sudden, the social collaboration centric angle becomes important. And that's where I think, again, this conversation, this discussion to me isn't about, you know, hey, there's this platform and this platform and which one should I choose? It's more about what can we learn from these, the application of these systems. And I did want to share just one example with you. It's a company called Pandexio and they're a learning platform. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But let, let's talk about their, their, this innovation. This would be something that years ago with Brandon Hall, when I was reviewing LMSs, I would have written down on that page. And then you're going to say, well, gosh, how would I ever add that to, uh, to what, I'm, you know, what I'm doing? But here's what they do. Pandexio is a platform. It's a document management learning platform where basically you, you categorize all your documents. And then experts in your organization can mark up sections of document and share it with specific groups as part of a learning experience. So what happens is you end up not just discussing on a thread, you're actually rallying around a document that may have something that's important and you're marking things up and notating it. And, and not only is the expert doing that, but also the people who are engaging in the collaboration. Wow. You know, again, is that just your traditional corporate LMS? No. Mm -hmm. Is that even an LXP? Not really. I mean, it kind of is. LXPs are about these little bits of micro learning and I can launch them anytime. But what about this idea that um, there's that cool innovation where I can have documents which are generally important to my organization? Maybe they're a process or procedure a policy, but maybe they're, you know, sharing some new trend information. The FDA does this with this is how they I, I did a project for the FDA where they talked about their training and learning. And of course, they have their compliance based learning. Of course, they have to do that. But then they do that. And I met with eight different groups at the FDA. Well, one of the groups was a group that handles uh, how do we deal with new medications or new uh, new biotech technologies? How do you train that? And it's one of those things that by the time you created a course on it, you sat down and said, I'm going to instructionally design a course and I'm going to do it on this brand new biotechnology. So six months later, you publish your course or three months later, you publish your course and, and it's all obsolete from day one. So what that group does is they have a way of of cultivating or of, of um, curating and pulling in the right kinds of information and sharing it with the learners at the right time. I'm going to pause on that. Think about that. It makes sense, doesn't it? And and this is the way that I think a lot of us, again, this this kind of group that I, I love hobnobbing with my fellow wizards, the people who are actually creating <laughs> learning. Can we do that without Pandexio or without some other technology? You know, you could. And it's cool, but if you if all of a sudden you stumble, like you said, Brent, on that need, it's there. It's something that's there. It could be applied to an ecosystem. 
Um, yeah. But it's also something that, that you can think about as an instructional designer. How do I learn from that example? How would I teach the FDA group about biotechnologies that is changing on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of a, a just a, topically that the fact that, um, as you say, something you, you know, there's a body of knowledge, but it's constantly changing. There's also um, in in that kind of an organization, there has to be a learner learner model that understands that things do change, do shift, and there's a need to be constantly getting new information. That's right. Um, so, so it probably lends itself to something um, I'm going to call it a less passive approach, uh, you know, on the behalf of, of learners who know that they need in order to do the job right, they need to be up constantly updates, updated on the information and constantly be getting the, you know, the newest information about something versus the traditional, here is the course and we're going to push it to you. And then right. the funny question quiz at the, at the end. Um, yeah. Jennifer's pointing out in the, uh, in the chat content curation hey, Jennifer. is the answer. Is the answer I know Jennifer I well. <laughs> and hello, Jennifer. Yeah. I've met Jennifer a few different times too. Nice to have yeah. you with us here today. Yeah. Um, uh, Halcyon is uh, mentioning sort of a, a couple of things, you know, just about the challenge of um, of figuring out. Um, let's get it, let's let's talk about maybe the you know the the process. Let's call it the audition process uh, rather than the sales process, but the the audition process for, of, of you know taking on or trying to figure out um, you know does does X Y or Z tool actually do. Yeah. Um, what we need it to do, and how do we how do we carry out that process of finding a, a new tool? What are some of the best things that we can do as a an organization in looking for a tool? Yeah, you're boy. I I could take I could that could be a whole discussion, but it's good. It's good because I wanted the discussion to drive this. Yeah. Um, you know, one for me. This is something that I just reflect back on my career, and I think this. Uh, uh, sometimes people know me as the guy who helps people, groups select learning management systems, and. I, I'm okay with that, uh, it, but I, I really look, step back and look at it as I like to step into an organization and have them think differently about how they're approaching learning. What is their learning strategy? So often I sit together with a group of a cross-functional group of teams. I love the fact that like at the FDA, I got to meet with eight different groups. It wasn't one, it was eight. Or I, I wrote down a couple projects. I worked for Microsoft. This was the most fascinating project. And I'm sure every one of you on this group would love to do this. And, and I'm, I've been in the unique position in my career to do this kind of thing. Microsoft hired me to say, we want you to come in and go around to our different groups that create learning. We want you to catalog and classify because you can see I'm, I'm that kind of guy. You know, I love to do that. Categorize all our different modalities of learning. Do a study, a macro study and say, which ones are the most effective? Which ones are the most cost effective? Which ones reach the audience the best? And so I ended up creating a slide deck with about 175 slides for Microsoft. <laughs> no, but it, but it was fun because what happened is I did identify about 40 different categorizations of modalities of learning. And so, and so get back to your question, Chris, it's like, it's like, it's like, um, you know, it's interesting to, to not, not just interesting, but, but fascinating to learn what those groups do how they produce it, how long does it take? We used our how long study as part of that. We, we could ask different groups, well, how long does it take to create a podcast for the drive time program at Microsoft? Because they have a thing called drive time. They know in the area, a lot of people have to drive to work. So they they use podcasts as a way of learning. Well, yeah, but look at learning they... platforms here. Where How am I gonna do a, a drive time type project? And how does that yeah, work? But I so- think... So what jump I like in to here do, and the process me... that I like to oh, use, sorry. and I don't have a picture of it, but that's okay because I don't need to do that. Um, well, let's see. I'm not going to pull one up here. Let's just leave this slide up so we have something to look at. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm going to go to another slide in the deck here because I, I, I did have a couple just ancillary slides. I like to cool, look hey, at it like this. While, while, you're, while you're pulling that up, uh, Brian, um, I, I was just thinking – you know, it, it's, it can be overwhelming. I think when you go into a big enterprise oh, yeah. like that, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you've got, you've got to look at all of that, all those different things. And uh, I had a couple of questions pop into my head and I, I don't, I don't want to no, try to try to overthink this, but like, so there, when you're, I think of podcasts as learning opportunities as well, but I think a lot of times our executives and people with, you know, when the learning department comes and says, you know, it would be great is if we had an internal corporate podcast where we, you know, sent it out and there, 
You might get a lot of pushback from the execs saying, well, that's not really training, is it? That's not what you guys do. And then you might have the academics saying, well, that's not really learning because (laughs) all you're doing is presenting information. And so really, you know, and then how do you track it? And how do you know if people are actually applying what they learned from the podcast to their jobs, right? I mean, at least, I don't know, maybe you don't get this kind of pushback, but I certainly do when I try to promote that kind of stuff. And then my, my second part of that question is, is um, we're often tasked with changing an entire corporation's culture, right? When they say we need some, we need a learning culture and maybe the training or learning department needs to do that, right? You know, how in the heck do we do that? And I may be getting us way off base with those questions, but no, you're not. (laughs) It's just, it's, it's burdening my brain to to think about it. So I'm going to unload it on you. (laughs) Well, and Brent, you've been on the back end of receiving what I call my use cases. So let me, I'm going to answer Chris's question at the same time, answer yours. Okay. And I'll be I'll be as brief as possible because I could do a two hour web or two hour mm-hmm. session just on well how what's the process to find an LMS? Well, we'll, we'll have you we'll have you back for some of that stuff. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm happy to do it anytime. But the, I use a five step model that I've used and I've used it for twenty years now, and it works. And it's it's such a good one. It, it it's really it's really quite simple in many ways, but it also makes my job fun. It's what I love about my job. I'm passionate about it. it it's a five step model. It looks like this. First thing you do is is visioning. So you've got to develop that learning vision. You can just, and basically you just get a group talking about what is today, what's our current state, what's our future state, and you get a group to represent multiple. Um, functions. Now, fortunately, I have the luxury of the fact that that's the kind of client that comes to me. They come to me saying, help us figure out what our learning strategy should be and then apply the learning technology. So so there's that whole visioning statement section. And then you shortlist the technologies based on that um, if we're learning choosing a learning management system. And the way we do that is by writing a thing called the use case document. The use case document describes their future state. Brent, I know you've seen, seen some of those from companies you've worked with in the past. And, and it's funny, a lot of the vendors in this space know my use case documents because they are very <laughs> picky. They describe that future state and what it should look like. So that's step two. Step three is then basically you invite that some learning technologies after you've shortlisted them. And again, that's where I get involved heavily too. They come in and they tell your story back to you using their technology. Boy, that's, and you know, that stretches the, the, te- the vendor like crazy. And it's so much better than a general demo that's just like, let me show you a demo of our cool LMS. Katung, 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 and you're going, wow, that's so cool. And maybe that should drive our strategy. No, that's the cart, that's the cart leading the horse. You you tell your story of your desired state. We pick the technologies or shortlist the technologies that are going to meet that. So that's the we call it the scripted demo stage. And then the next stage is then you ask for a bid. Well, wait a minute. Why didn't we ask for the bid first? And the answer is, well, maybe in our shortlisting, our budget might be a thing that drives that list anyway. So now now we can tell you as an organization, what is our learning strategy? What does it look like? And what we're trying to do with our learning technologies. Now we want to bid around. Now, you know what our vision looks like. What's it going to cost? And then the last step is to narrow it down to a few and pick something. And that's that idea that that's kept me in business uh, for many, many years. Um, it's, it's that idea that, uh, I go out and I type, what's the best LMS and I get a laundry list of LMSs <laughs> and I can't make head or tails of it because they're, when I look at those lists, they're mixed modes. And I even see other, my fellow analysts in the industry it drives me crazy, but sometimes they'll say, let me list the top 10 LMSs out there. They are, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know what that, what it looks like to me, it looks like, well, what are the 10 best, uh, Oh, I, I should have thought of a better analogy, but what are the 10 best uh, household items that are, are about, I don't know, or the things that I use are useful in my house? Well, my microwave is really helpful, but so is my, you know, this, and it's, and they're complete apples, oranges, kumquats, they're just, you know, it's all over mm-hmm. the map. And that's what those top 10 lists look like maybe to other folks. It's like, it's why I had to go back to this idea of, well, what category, I mean, what category are we talking about? What are you trying to do? Are you a, a, a vendor trying to sell your courses? Are you doing customer education like came up in the chat? Are what, yeah. what you know, and and if you are, how do you want to engage those customers? Can we describe that state? And the, by that, we take the, the 800 or 1,000 or however many systems, we start to narrow that list till it comes down to a manageable size, and then you move forward. 
So now, Pod, now Brent, here's a question, I think, and I was on that slide for that purpose. Podcasts, of course, you consider them, yeah, they're good learning, but now you've got to make a business case of it. Now, Microsoft, it's easy. All these people are driving to work. It's wasted time, in other words, maybe. Maybe they're listening to an audible book or maybe they're listening to music in their car. Why not use it as an opportunity to share and cross cultivate new ideas? So again, if it's applied in the right area, uh, even your senior managers can start to see, wow, that's a valuable time. We can we could use some of that time and we can collect information on what ex people have been exposed to because we can attach that back to a, a skill set list or, or, or we, we can keep a transcript. That's what all these back office technologies allow us to do. And so, so a good example of that one is I have a group that, that does training in auto dealerships. And they not only know what people have, what courses they've gone through, the auto dealerships, the staff that runs those auto dealerships, they know which of the um, uh, best practices and guides and things that they've read. So they, they, they can have a profile of the exposure of a typical learner. What do they know? What don't they know? And that's just reading, you know, but it's, but it's, did they go check out a, a document that was really cool from uh, the National Association and read it? Uh, and I can know that. Yeah. I mean, the, the technologies allow me to do that. It, it's something like a, a, a podcast. We, we, we think of it, I mean, we're talking about it as if it's a, a thing of its own, but you can integrate that with other things, right? A podcast oh, sure. could be like, you're talking about dealerships. A podcast could, could be, um, you know, experiences, people sharing, you know, something that occurred to them in a sales cycle or whatever. But there's also then, you know, pointers in, within the podcast to, hey, we have these, you know, toolkits or, or these other things that you can, you know, that you can go to, which those things are definitely trackable because you can see who's, you know, opened right. something up or, or looked at it, et cetera, and, and, and leading people on into, uh, you know, so so the podcast in your diagram here, level one That's learning, right. well, we're presenta presenting information, et cetera. Uh, but it can also, you know, if, if people have that problem and it resonates and they, oh, you tell them that there's also some, some, you know, toolkits, well, that moves them into level two, uh, you know, of doing and being able to do and, and more, most importantly for what we do, uh, yeah. doing better in, in their in their job for sure. Yeah, sure. And, and this slide is from a deck that I use called Optimizing Learning. And I go into organizations and share this information. What they're trying to often do is not just to create a reactionary learning operation. They're trying to create a continuous learning operation. Mm -hmm. And so notice you, my development ratios are in here, Chris, the ones you mentioned. Development <laughs> ratio, 79 to 1 for, for, um, for level one learning. Well, what is level one learning? Level one learning, by definition, is it's a way to teach facts and concepts. And, and me, I'm... I'm, I'm so unsophisticated, and this, this is, I'll, I'll, I'll kick myself here. I went through uh, two years of an instructional design program, got a master's degree, learned all about the instructional design models. They were too complex for me. I had to think of <laughs> something simpler. So I came up with my three, my three items for my instructional design model. People learn, they do, and then they apply. So there's, there's a prescription to this. And then again, the technologies help with this. If I'm going to teach something that people need to learn or remember, there's a certain development ratio to do that. What kinds of things am I teaching? Facts and concepts. How often, you know, this is where micro learning can come into place. Two to five minutes of duration. If they're doing something, you know, that's actual pra practice level. They actually literally have to do something and demonstrate their competency. And so uh, there's an accountability involved. I'll use, I'll use a simple example of that. One of my clients is the Red Cross. You can go to the Red Cross and you can take a course on CPR. Now, if I ask most people, how many of you would like to learn to have somebody perform CPR on you that learned it online? <laughs> See how just laughs come? I mean, it, it really is there. But do you, know, do you know you can go out and take a CPR course from the Red Cross online and you can get your certificate that says CPR? Now here's why it works. You start with the concepts and facts. They teach you that in an online self-paced mode. As soon as that's done, the, uh, the learning technology kicks you into a scheduling session with the mannequin and the instructor who's gonna actually have you show your ability to do chest compressions. And that's the do. So they move from the learn to the do. Do doesn't always have to be an online step. Nice. That's that. That's that hybrid model, right? That, that would yep. that would in your chart, right? That the the hybrid piece of it. And I think, 
I think that's where a lot of people are headed and we don't really have much choice, right? Because of there's so many different types of things that we can create now as instructional designers, right? Like back in the day when, when the three of us were all coming up as, as newbies in the industry, really the only thing that training departments and that learning professionals created were courses. Quote, unquote, <laughs> that was, that was pretty much it, right? That was our sole job. Instructional design was invented to help us do that one very focused thing. Now as instructional designers, we see this world of opportunity that the internet opened up for us, that technologies opened right. up for us, like mobile devices and all that kind of stuff, right? And live streaming and videos and podcasts and all that kind of stuff. And now, now our heads are exploding. It's like, wow, I could deliver training here, 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 here. But wait a minute, how do I pull all this stuff together? That's where the platforms and ecosystems come in. And that's where I think a lot of times people just throw their hands up and are grateful for someone like you to come in and, and pull yeah. all those pieces together for them. Well, and, and they and they they realize it and they love to have those discussions because all of a sudden they're looking at it from a different set of light. And Brent, to your point, and, and even people who saw the title of this session might have thought this immediately. My first reaction might have been LMS is how boring. <laughs> and and LMS can become a bar it could become a barrier if you're not careful to that innovation. But I'm here to tell you that what's interesting is if you look at it the right way, you wrangle it. Yeah. Then you can figure out how to do it because a lot of people are trying to figure out how do I hammer those cool, innovative ways to teach and learn into my structure into my LMS structure, which was created at a time when really there were only three kinds of learning. There was e-learning. <laughs> There's classroom based or face to face, which was still dominant and, and is still dominant, even even with the pandemics, that's still dominant and virtual classroom. Yeah. But that if that's the end of it, th those are the organizations I don't like to spend a lot of time with, because if that's all they want to do, I'm a waste of their money. <laughs> you know, I, it's, and I think a lot of you working in the organizations that you're working in, hopefully, you know, you want to get beyond that, too. It's like it's like what what's next? How do we and and so we were talking a lot about social collaboration, for example. That's a, something you do at the apply level. This is where face to face or collaborating online, sharing experiences. Chris, you mentioned that. You said, "Hey, a podcast is a great way to share what I and I call it a war story. Hmm. Share an experience." Um, the development ratio is low on that, forty nine to one, which is basically talk. And so it's like developing something to talk about. So, so again, that it's that that's the interesting part now. I've got this big other map that's Bloom's taxonomy. All oh, some instructional designers know that. And I started mapping it and adding these things. It's some of the modalities that can be applied at those level in the best possible way. So we start over here with facts. We can teach that through pre-reading. And I tell my organization, very first and foremost, get rid of the word pre. If you say pre-reading, pre-reading, people don't consider that part of the learning. It's optional. It's ancillary. What if it's required? And I've seen organizations very successfully apply reading as, a, as, a, as an instructional strategy that actually has accountability. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we think of that, we think of um, some things we think of as innovative, which really you know have been around with this, like what you're describing of pre-reading. Well, that's technically, I would say, falls into the category of a flipped classroom model, right? Where you're, yeah. you're, sure. the learning is done ahead and then the, the, the actual time together is spent on the, those higher end things that you can that you can only accomplish um, together as a group. There are uh, we're, we're getting close to our, our countdown time here, but th there are a couple yeah. of questions. And what I'm going to suggest, um, like Bob's asking about LMSs that work best for gamification and leaderboards. And Karen's asking a bit more about um, serving both internal training needs and customer education from from the same tool. I think maybe if, if, if it's not too much of an imposition, maybe Karen and, and Bob could reach out to you just to get some more specifics, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe some of the things you've seen in that area. That would be brilliant. Um, I know in a couple of minutes here as we wrap up, we'll get you to toss your contact info in uh, sure. into the uh, into the um, into the box there in the chat stuff. Um, there is the music. We are getting ready to dance on out of here. <laughs> um, Brian, thanks so much for for, for joining yeah. us here today. It's been so it's been uh, it, it's been so fascinating. You, you know, um, Jennifer had a comment in the in the chat earlier about you know LMS is the core function is is almost all the same. Um, and yet there's, there's always little themes and variations that, that happen that make each different uh, vendor's tool 
um, you know, different and unique, et cetera. So uh, it's so much, it's like sifting sometimes, you know, you're at, I don't know, you're at the creek and the, there's all the water coming. So you throw some gravel in and you see what gold sticks in the bottom. And maybe that's the tool for, for you in particular or for your organization. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of work involved in that if you're if you're trying to get there to, to bring in a tool like that in your own organization. So so thanks again for joining us. Folks, you Brian's contact info is in the chat there. We'll uh, we'll dance on out of here. Thanks everybody for the great ideas in the chat too thanks. today. And, and the thanks, great Brian, too. so yeah. much. There's so much for us to talk about. And we, oh, there we, is. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have you back on, and we'll 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 drill into some of these specifics maybe, or something like that next time. Any any time, I'm happy to All do right. it. All awesome right, thanks, brew. man. We appreciate Gang. it. It's great to see you as always. Here we go. Yeah. Don't forget to leave the group. Yeah. Oh yeah. I got that. Big ending. Right. <laughs> Adios, everybody. Have a good one.